I am a huge fan of the World of Darkness. For those of you not in the know, the World of Darkness refers to the shared universe by White Wolf for their various lines of supernatural horror roleplaying. You may be familiar with Vampire the Masquerade, which is by and large its most well-known property, but there are other ones too. The World of Darkness resembles our world, but it's darker and much more dangerous. It's a world where nights last longer, where shadows creep around more corners, where the police take longer to respond to calls of emergency, and the American urban gothic is much more prevalent. It's a world of gothic horror superimposed onto our own, and you play as the monsters that inhabit it. Vampires, werewolves, mages, wraiths, fey, and for some reason, mummies, are all foci for various game lines developed in this world, each with their own unique powers, perspectives, and permutations. It's not an understatement to say that I adore this setting. Vampire the Masquerade is by and large my favorite tabletop role-playing game, and I have spent countless hours poring over its content over the years. I'd wager that most people are familiar with this franchise, if not from the world of tabletop RPGs, then certainly through Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines, the last of the three games developed by Troika before the company went under in 2005. While it was a major underperformer in its own time, Bloodlines is now a substantially popular cult classic, so much so that a sequel is being developed for it due to its rather strong brand in the video game market space, despite being a 15 year old title at this point. Hell, it's probably my favorite video game of all time, and if not my favorite, certainly one of my favorites. But I'm not here to talk about Bloodlines today. Oh no. I want to talk about the other vampire game that was made. Vampire the Masquerade Redemption. This was the first attempt at making a viable vampire video game. It was developed by Nihilistic Software and published by Activision. And it came out on PC in 2000, a solid four years before Bloodlines did. Out of the two video games made for Vampire, this is the one that most people aren't really aware of, at least comparatively, despite it technically being woven into Vampire's tabletop canon far earlier than Bloodlines. And there's a reason for that. Redemption isn't particularly good, and I have some serious misgivings with this game. It oozes with atmosphere, and I really like that it tries to tie itself into the tabletop game as much as it does through a very carefully constructed story and various nods to the source material. But the key word here is tries, because its execution is horrendous. Redemption seems to eschew many of the themes that you expect a vampire game to emulate. And in fact, it doubles down on these aspects, much to the game's detriment. The solution to every problem is to kill it, and the moral choices that the game offers are vapid and listless. Rather than following something more akin to Planescape Torment and its approach, focusing on a very, very strong narrative and building systems that would enhance exploration, introspection, and plot resolution, Redemption chose to be more like a watered-down Diablo-like dungeon crawler, and very few of its gameplay systems and structures mesh well with the narrative vision that the game tries to instill. Perhaps this would be forgiven if it managed to offer solid gameplay, but it utterly fails in that regard, making some sections of this game almost rage quit inducing. It's a shame, really, because I was hoping for a lot more out of this title. Visually, the game is fairly impressive. It's dated, to be sure, but even now the graphics are still pretty good. But even back during the game's initial release, the graphics were one of the game's aspects that were praised almost unanimously. Characters and environments have a surprisingly high level of detail. Character models have clear and defining features, as do textured surfaces and items that drop on the ground as you play the game. Now, to be fair, I did use an HD texture pack that upscaled the game's textures to a higher resolution, and it does make them look a lot sharper. The lighting system is also fairly well done, and despite it not doing a whole lot to emphasize Redemption's origins as a horror game, its ambient lighting and shadows really do add to the game's dark atmosphere, especially during the sections of the game that take place during the medieval era. When a game recalculates shadow angles based on the direction of the various light sources that you pass by on a nighttime street, you can tell that there was effort put into the game's lighting, and a good lighting system can make a huge difference in how a game's visuals are presented. 
I'm not much of a sucker for really good graphics. In fact, I don't rank graphics as being very important to the overall experience of the games I play. But I do have to say that this game's graphics are easily one of its strong points. However, the game's camera angles are a problem. They're very limited in terms of width, and you can't adjust the height very much at all, aside from adjusting it to have a top-down perspective. This means that outside of using the game's first-person mode, you can't look up either. As a result, everything looks very tight and claustrophobic. Even the GOG version of this game, which is the one that I was using, doesn't actually fix this for widescreen resolutions. It has widescreen options, but all this does is move the camera even closer to your characters and it further limits your viewing angles. For this, I recommend that you use the widescreen fix, which I've linked in the description below. It narrows the UI and creates these annoying pillar boxes, but at the very least you have a viewing field that scales to your desktop resolution. I also use DG Voodoo to make the game a bit brighter, since the in-game brightness options don't exactly work. I'm not sure if that's coming across in this captured footage, but it makes the game much more comfortable to play. The only downside is that it made my menu options appear distorted, but it doesn't affect any of the in-game graphics as far as I can tell, and as far as I'm concerned, a bit of main menu discoloration is well worth the price of having an FOV with proper vertical orientation. Throughout the game, you control a party of various different characters, although your main character is Christoph Romuald, a French knight, crusader, and member of the Order of the Sword Brethren. He got wounded in battle in the Moravian Hills, but luckily his boys managed to save his life by dragging him to Prague, where his wounds were tended to by the nuns at the convent of the Knights of the Red Cross, while his brothers went on to go pursue their enemies in the east. The nuns at the convent gave him up for dead, except for one, Sister Inezka, who nursed him back to health. Kristoff, naturally, quickly falls in love with her. After regaining some of his strength, he learns that Prague is plagued by ghouls, and he heads down into the silver mine to defeat the vampire that controls them. None of this is enough to convince the convent's archbishop that Kristoff is a good dude, however, and so the jealous archbishop sends Kristoff to the streets to defend the town after dark on patrol duty. Which, of course, leads the convent open for a little bit of vengeance while he's gone. Eventually, our boy Kristoff gets back to the convent and confesses his love to Aneska, who reveals that she loves him back. But because Kristoff is a noble guy who doesn't want to see either of them damned because of their lust, and also because he doesn't want to put her in any more danger, he flees the convent. From there, one of the local vampires of Prague accosts Kristoff and embraces him, turning him into a vampire before any of the other clans have a chance to do so. From there, Kristoff undergoes a number of different quests across the game, taking him from medieval Prague and Vienna to modern-day London and New York City. Each city acts as a hub with connecting districts that are filled with a number of different vendors, including weapons and armor and occult items. You're free to explore these more or less at your leisure, although you're barred from entering certain quest areas until you progress far enough on the main storyline in order to access them. But they're nevertheless still there, labeled and marked on your map and everything, which feels really jarring and kills some of the suspense and the mystery of wherever your quest may take you. Like for instance, in New York City, I can walk right up to the Cathedral of Flesh, which by the way, by itself, is incredibly ridiculous for a number of different lore reasons, but because I haven't done the quest leading up to that particular mission, all I can do is tug on the doorknob a little bit and move on. That being said, I did rather like the game's story overall, even with the long exposition dumps. I'm a Metal Gear Solid fan, what can I say? And the change in setting from the dark medieval to the modern day is a really awesome transition that explores a lot of the themes that the tabletop game tries to get across with the struggle of new versus old and how vampires are essentially frozen in a set time and are forced to adapt as the world around them changes. The game's audio is inconsistent, both in terms of quality and in presentation. Some of the voice actors are pretty good, and you can tell that at least some level of effort has been put into the performance. Damned, I can't help but no one is alone with old Pink around. Especially not a fella Bruja. Here's to Christoph, the last of the Prometheans. Welcome to the new world, Squire. Hope you like what we've done with the place. Others come off as so poorly done that it sounds almost amateurish. I will enjoy the taste of thy Bruja blood. It is so clean compared to the sweet corruption of Zamitzi blood. Bid the devil greetings from me, for I send thee to hell! Yeah, can you believe that's the same voice actress who played Samara in Mass Effect 2 and 3? What was the name of the ship she left on? 
Audio mixing isn't great either, with noticeable rises and drops in quality when it comes to voice lines. For instance, when the character Lily is first introduced, you'll notice something about her lines is a little off. Please protect me. I'll help you with whatever you need. There are noticeable crackles in the audio, and it sounds like the gain is set a little too high. Not to mention that there are a few times where dialogue lines are completely cut off, and NPCs will spout their voice lines at the most inappropriate of times. Like when you're in the middle of a dialogue in front of them. I'm from oh, Clan Toreador. I'll flush Prove those it. white cheeks. Who are cry, cry, cry? Or if you're in the middle of draining their blood during combat. Come, fool. I wish to test my newfound powers. My favorite instance, though? This building right here, where you can pinpoint the exact spot that the background audio is programmed to begin playing. You can almost see precisely where the envelopes start and stop. Now, that's all well and good, but it's in the game's gameplay where it starts to fall apart a little bit. And that's really saying something. Movement is simple. You point and you click and your character will go to that point. Easy. The problem is that movement is clunky and the game has some serious pathfinding issues. Characters will stop in their tracks if they bump into another character in front of them, and instead of trying to go around, they keep trying to go forward as if thinking that, hey, eventually, maybe, they'll move right through the thing that's blocking them. It's a very cumbersome system, and it's extremely annoying to see companions stuck behind objects when entering combat. Or just to find them standing there and not moving because they decided to stop following in the previous hallway. Now, as an RPG, Vampire Redemption is serviceable. Throughout the adventure, the player commands a coterie of vampires through a series of dungeons that involves a lot of combat and plenty of looting. And if you're familiar with the tabletop game at all, you should have alarm bells going off in your head. This is the first warning sign that the game isn't quite what you may expect if you're a fan of Vampire the Masquerade. The tabletop game isn't one that focuses heavily on combat or dungeoneering. It's a game about social interaction and personal horror. Combat takes a back seat to the intrigue and the politicking of the undead world, so adapting a game whose focus is on role-playing and not tactical combat into an action RPG that takes a lot of clues from Diablo lends itself to some pretty shoddy design. Now, to the game's credit, it attempts to retain some of these themes with its humanity system. Simply put, the game has three endings, and which one you get largely depends on Kristoff's humanity rating, which is an abstraction of how much of a monster that the vampire characters in the game are. Killing city guards and draining innocents of all their blood will lower your humanity, and so will certain dialogue options that are presented to you throughout the game. Conversely, occasionally a dialogue choice will raise your humanity too, but these options are much less frequent. Aside from modifying your humanity, these dialogue options serve no purpose in the game. There aren't any dialogue or persuasion checks, and the only way to solve any problem is through combat. And that's pretty much the extent of the game's sense of choice and consequence in roleplaying. It's a very linear game, and the majority of its replay value comes out from testing different builds and experimenting with different playstyles. Now, I don't think that a game needs to have deep choice and consequences in order to be a good RPG. It needs to have some expression of player freedom, whether it's through the story or through the gameplay. And luckily, Vampire Redemption does have this through its gameplay systems. However, those gameplay systems aren't particularly great, and that portion of the game is nothing short of spectacularly irritating. There were far too many instances where I was just about ready to stop playing this game due to the anger I was dealing with at the game's combat. Among the biggest offenders are, along with the aforementioned camera issues, the supreme difficulty that making sort of any selection entails. There were way too many instances over the course of the game where I would send a party member to feed off of an enemy to refill their blood pool, only to send them to feed off of my character or another party member instead. Or when the combat would devolve into a melee and selecting any sort of enemy is a minigame unto itself. You can pause the game during combat, just press the pause key on the keyboard, which is already inconvenient enough due to its location, but this function was only added after the 1.1 patch. 
Can you imagine playing this game on launch with such a basic quality of life feature on a party based role playing game that has combat as its central focus missing? On top of that, the ability to save anywhere was also only added on this patch, making the dungeon areas all the more treacherous if you didn't have the ability to teleport back to your haven unlocked, or if you didn't have any teleportation scrolls on you. Furthermore, the AI is broken for both enemies and your allies. Enemies have a habit of running away if you can't land a killing blow, forcing you to chase them and hope that your rolls succeed against their defenses while watching characters stutter and bump into things while trying to catch up to them. And too often will allies run into combat and expend all of their blood regardless of whether or not the situation calls for it. Of all these expenditures, they rarely use it to heal themselves during combat. It's not uncommon for your party members to rush into battle against two or three enemies that can be made short work of by simply whacking them over the head a few times, but the AI will use this as a cue to cast some of their more expensive disciplines and use their consumables up, even if those options are disabled in the main menu. The game thus devolves into a constant exercise in resource management, as it forces you to constantly find ways to make sure that they still have blood in them, or else they will frenzy and they'll attack anything on site including your non-frenzying party members. I often found myself having to slow down and either feed my companion's blood from my main character or find ways to kite individual enemies, use my powers to feed off of them, and then babysit my companions while they fed. Because on top of all that, your AI companions will cancel their feed action midway through completion nearly every single time, and I cannot figure out why they do this. They let go of the enemy and the enemy will start to fight against you again, forcing another round of combat where your allies will again just expend their blood. Now on the other hand, I feel that the game's powers were one of the most enjoyable parts of the game. Because your party members are all vampires of various different types, you have access to a widespread of these powers, and many of them quite closely resemble their tabletop counterparts. They're pretty fun to use, and their wide reach means that it's fun to experiment with them to see what kind of combinations work well with each other throughout the game's campaign. This part alone almost makes combat worth all the trouble, because again, like Diablo, you have a wide variety of different combinations and things you can sink points into, and on no single playthrough will you be able to master everything. However, these powers by themselves are not enough to redeem this game's combat, which is just a frustrating experience from start to finish. Well, hang on, let me go back on that a little bit. While I cannot stress enough how unenjoyable the combat is, I think I mean that I cannot stress enough how unenjoyable it is during some of the game's earlier areas in its first half. Two areas in particular had me seething. Aiden's Chantry and the Stevens Dome. The former is due to a flurry of strong enemies that are placed with reckless abandon all over the level, and the latter is due to an environmental danger that does not work well with shoddy pathfinding. However, after that point, the game just gets laughably easy. Just before the halfway point of the game, you can find a two-handed sword that just decimates anything in its path. Which makes sense since, according to lore, this is supposed to be the sister sword to the one that's used by Dracula, but nonetheless. If you combine this weapon with the discipline that lets you steal blood from enemies at range, suddenly the game becomes a cakewalk. From this point on, I went from being frustrated due to how hard the combat was, to almost frustrated with how easy it was. Don't get me wrong, the game is much more enjoyable after that point, but it's just jarring to see that much imbalance in a game that doubles down on dungeon crawling and combat systems. I don't mind games that are imbalanced as much as other people do, because sometimes I like to experiment to see how far I can break a game and just have fun running roughshod over it. But the intensity in which the pendulum swings in Redemption is frankly ridiculous. Combat is easily the worst thing that this game has going for it, which is really bad considering that this is a game that's focused almost entirely on combat. Also, I have a bone to pick with the fact that this game doesn't have any item highlighting, save for the very moment where you hover your mouse over top of the object itself. This applies to both interactive sage objects as well as loot drops. This is particularly annoying because the game does a really good job of hiding things into environment backgrounds, and it makes them blend in fairly frequently. This sort of thing is commonplace all game, and it adds a lot of pointless backtracking and painstaking object hunting to what's already a tumultuous experience. Dropped loot is one thing, but the game also does this with levers and buttons needed to open doors, 
And there's even a boss fight with an interactive object that I didn't realize was interactive until I went back to find out why I suddenly lost 10 points of humanity in between stages. At the very least, the game could have panned to the object during the dialogue cutscene to hint that it's some way associated with the fight, but it doesn't do that. Instead, it punishes you for following the exact same pattern that you've been following up until now in every single similar situation. Redemption also has one really unique addition that I think deserves a little bit of talking about. And that's its storyteller mode, which is essentially an online component where one person can play the role of a GM and the other, the characters. By itself, this concept is fascinating, especially since Redemption came out a full two years before Neverwinter Nights did, and this mode in that game was especially popular. In practice, however, it seems that the tools given to the ST's disposal are lacking a fair bit. Menu navigation is a bit clunky, and you need to move around the ST avatar, which is a giant floating head, around the map in order to place down objects. It also lets you possess characters and created objects, but I'll admit I haven't really delved too deep into this mode. The online servers have long since shut down, and I doubt the game has the sort of population that would support this mode if there was a workaround. Nevertheless, I did want to showcase it just a little bit more as a curiosity from a bygone age that's, at the very least, a pretty cool concept. And I do appreciate the attempt at trying to offer players a toolbox to use to prolong the game's life. But as far as the game's single player goes, playing through Vampire Redemption has been nothing short of a roller coaster. Never in recent memory have I felt more tolerance for a game that has made me feel as irate as this one has. I don't know if it's the setting, or the source material, or the game's story, or a combination of all of these things that kept me going throughout the end. I find Redemption strangely enjoyable, all things considered, and I could see myself going through it again, albeit heavily modded and totally overhauled, like with the Age of Redemption mod or something. However, despite that, I don't think I could recommend this game in good faith. While I enjoyed it, even with its shortcomings, I don't think that Redemption has enough going for it to make it a game that's worth looking into today, unless you're either extremely dedicated to the lore of Vampire the Masquerade, or you're really hardcore into CRPGs and you can tolerate a whole heap of questionable mechanics. Unlike Call of Cthulhu Dark Corners of the Earth, Redemption doesn't do enough to make me want to go out on a limb and say that this is something that's worth stomaching. The story was good, and I loved seeing the transition from the Dark Age setting into the Modern Knights, and once I got over that hump just before the midpoint, it did get better. But it's still a pretty weak RPG with some really bad mechanics, with no sense of appropriate difficulty curve, and a myriad of issues that just get in the way of the story. I found this game strangely charming, probably because I'm a Vampire the Masquerade superfan, but if you're looking to enter the world of darkness for the first time, or you really want to check out an RPG where playing a vampire sounds like a great old time, don't bother with Vampire the Masquerade Redemption. It stumbles a few too many times to be worth the headache. And besides, its successor pulled off bringing Vampire the Masquerade to PCs leaps and bounds better. Mm -hmm.